wait a second. As soon as I start doing activity, my body's going to start utilizing oxygen. What about this whole anaerobic pathway? What, what about all those workouts that were all for the anaerobic system? But the thing I always forgot about was the fact that I never appreciated how that hamstring was utilizing fuel. Because I can rehab it. I can get it stronger. You know what I mean? I can work on the proprioceptive aspects of that tissue. But at the end of the day, if it's starving for energy, when you put it back out on the field, it's not going to go well. I want to win games. I want to blow people out of the water, right? I want to have a situation where my head coach knows that they have an advantage over the opposition. If they call a timeout, their athletes can fully recover their oxygen levels due to the fact that my athletes don't have a respiratory limitation. If you would have came to me when I was a collegiate strength coach and told me that, you know, the respiratory system was the thing that was limiting all my athletes' performance, I'd tell you, get out of here. Welcome to the Upside Strength Podcast, the fitness and performance resource in Switzerland. Today, I'm happy to welcome on the show strength and conditioning coach and movement specialist, Patrick Estes. Hey, Pat, how you doing today? Hey, how you doing? Thanks, Thanks. for having me, man. It's a pleasure to be here. No, it's, it's great to have you, Pat. So maybe to get started, could you talk a little bit about who you are and what you do? Uh, right now, I am working with Aaron Davis at Evolve Health and Performance in Austin, Texas. Um, I am, when I was thinking about how to answer this question, I was like, man, I'm definitely the product of being incredibly blessed to be around amazing coaches uh, my entire life. And I'm just going to be telling you basically what taught me. Um, so I've had the pleasure of working with guys like Todd Wright and Logan Schwartz, um, learning from Gary Gray, Dave Tiberio, um, you know, other strength coaches like Jim Radcliffe, like had a big influence on me when I visited him at Oregon. Uh, I'm missing like a million people in my high school strength coaches. So I, I'm not definitely a, the smartest guy in the room at all, but I was just smart enough to know that if I surrounded myself with incredibly intelligent people that uh, I would see the benefits of that. And I, and I definitely feel like I have, and it led me to, to basically working with Aaron and um, it's been, it's been great ever since. What do you feel were your biggest blind spots when you started out and uh, what did those different, you know, coaches, influences, mentors, uh, help you figure out along the way uh, throughout your career? Man, that's a great question. Uh, I would probably say like I, my big blind spot was, is I started out mostly reading like muscle and, m muscle and fiction, muscle and fitness, right? That's where we kind of started. Like you wanted to get jacked and strong. And so I was, uh, I was a high school football player and then ended up playing college lacrosse and I busted my ass in the weight room and just continually got hurt over and over and over again and didn't understand it. And then uh, I had, you know, was started going to some hammer strength conferences, perform better. And then I got the opportunity to walk into the weight room at the University of Texas and saw Todd Wright loading his basketball players, you know, and squatting them in all different positions. And I was just like, I was like, this guy doesn't even have these guys squatting right. What's going on? <laughs> And, and then elaborate I, on the different positions that he was. Yeah, I was just like, I was like, why is he doing that? Just feet right here. Like, don't be moving them. <laughs> and I was just like, what a young idiot I was. And uh, and they were like, well, does a basketball player always get a rebound and their feet land in the exact same place? No. You know what I mean? And then that mm -hmm. kind of started, you know, I spent the next uh, basically like five years just diving down. Uh, Gary Gray, Dave Tiberio did the gift program. Um, and my, I was like this with chain reaction biomechanics and three dimensional movement and, and else. And, and it was basically when another, another colleague was like, I was like, Hey, what about this? Uh, you know, there's people doing table tests and there's other physical therapists that don't do this 3d movement. Like, how do they get results? I don't understand. Mm -hmm. And they were like, Oh, well, all that's bullshit. And I was like, it's all bullshit. I was like, okay, well. I'll just go figure it out for myself. And I ended up doing, taking a bunch of PRI courses and diving down that rabbit hole. And uh, about that time I was uh, 
collegiate when I really dove into the PRI pretty hard, I was a collegiate strength coach at the University of Denver mm-hmm. and was uh had worked for probably one of the best coaches of all time. Uh and their men's their men's lacrosse coach was Bill Tierney. And he's like the Bill Belichick of lacrosse coaches. Mm-hmm. And working for him, I learned a tremendous amount and he actually let you know he gave me some autonomy to to do some of this weird stuff that I was doing the 3d motion and then trying to figure out how to apply PRI principles to it and but at the same time I look back and I was just like man I still didn't know anything about the right way to condition my athletes Mm -hmm. I was like they play lacrosse we should probably sprint you know what I mean (laughs) we should do some you know I I thought I knew what I was conditioning wise and I thought I knew how the body utilized energy. Should I had read Joel Jameson's MMA conditioning book. I was, <laughs> as we, I was, as we all did. Yeah. I was like, check, covered, you know, I go down the list of like, yeah. okay, I'm doing one of these workouts. Okay. 30 seconds on 30 seconds off. Check doing that. All right, good. I was like, man, my workout program's got everything, but I didn't have, I didn't have a clue. You know what I mean? I was half asleep during A and P in college. So I think, it was slowly kind of getting around guys like Aaron and and Brian and being like, I should know more about this. And two things are not what they seem. And even if I was awake during A&P, the stuff that they were saying wasn't right anyway. So I was like, well, this is good. (laughs) I can start from scratch. Um, But I don't know if that answered your question or not, but it it does. uh, They, as I basically, as far, as far as all these coaches, like mm-hmm. I was filled with holes, you know, and I've just been lucky enough to be placed in certain positions from people that are way smarter than me. And they just let me fill the hole a little bit. And so I think I'm pretty, I'm pretty decent now, but you asked me in five years, I hopefully I'm full of shit here too. And I've gotten better. <laughs> Uh, maybe going back to the last two coaches you mentioned whom I've had the pleasure to exchange with Aaron Davis and Brian Kozak um, what are the biggest perspective changes that these two brought to you as a coach since you started working with them um well Brian Aaron that's a hard question to answer Brian it's easier because uh he's he's a yogi and you know breathing is the most fundamental thing we do in life you know you know you come into this world you take a breath and when you leave this world you know that's your that's your final exhale Mm. and so uh brian has definitely uh brought the practical side of kind of the bioenergetics and instead of the complicated side which is normally you you want to go in the weeds of somebody you got to talk to aaron and then He'll take you down as far as you want to go. Mm-hmm. And so sometimes he even loses me and I work with him. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Brian kind of was that other half of somebody else who had, he's really the only other person when, to tell you a quick backstory, I remember being when I was at University of Maryland and I hired Aaron as an Omega Wave consultant mm-hmm. because I, you know, I have, I've got these, I've got these basketball players. I got a bunch of money to spend. Let's do a mega wave. Let's do force plays. Let's do everything. Right. And of course I'm not taking time to try to figure it out. Cause I got to, you know, do a million other things. So he was helping us with it. And then he was just like, Hey, you should look into breathing and respiration. And I'm like, I don't got time to look into breathing and respiration. You know what I mean? We got to get guys strong here. You know, there's no time. There's no time. <laughs> and I remember looking back and a bit and looking at it now and I was just like, man, he had, he had told me this stuff a long time ago. Mm-hmm. And uh, I had kind of just dismissed it as not being that important or it was too weird for me to pull off in my environment. You know, I was just like, my head coach isn't going to go for breathing, you know, but mm-hmm. it was because I didn't take the time to understand how important it really was. Um, and then I would say like Aaron's really taught me, you know, kind of just how does a cell utilize it, you know, what, what I'm, what I'm reading in books and like, it's crazy. It's crazy now because you'll go online and you'll hear somebody talk or you'll talk to another strength coach and they'll use the word anaerobic. And you're just kind of like, like, Hey, you know, that shit ain't right anymore. <laughs> you know, <laughs> there's not, there's uh, when we first started using the moxie, it was like, Aaron had already kind of got his head around it, but I was still like, wait a second. 
as soon as I start doing activity, my body's going to start utilizing oxygen. What about this whole anaerobic pathway? What, what about all those workouts that I was that were all for the anaerobic system? And that took me a while to wrap my head around. Mm -hmm. And I think it takes a lot of coaches to wrap their head around something that like, man, what I was doing for the past 10 years wasn't right. You know, and, and not a lot of coaches want to be like, okay, well, I, I screwed all that up. I'm going to go back, erase everything, yeah. go from the drawing board. And even like last week we had an intern come in and we're trying to explain to her all the different hats and things that she is going to learn from energetics to rehab, to training, um, to nutrition. Right. And she was like, Hey, can you recommend a good nutrition book for me to read so I can get up to speed on what you guys are doing? And I didn't have a good answer for it, but I told her like, it's hard because if we don't even have like the most fundamental understanding of how a cell utilizes energy, mm -hmm. you know, fuel. And we're talking about fueling an athlete and we're still unclear about what happens. How can we possibly make proper recommendations for somebody from a nutritional standpoint? Mm -hmm. So it kind of like, once you start going down this rabbit hole of understanding that energetics isn't what we're taught, like it starts to flip the head on everything. Cause at the end of the day, like, understanding how a cell utilizes energy is 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 rehab is training mm -hmm. is, is speed work is nutrition it's it's a little bit of everything you can't you can't deny it yeah that's definitely one of the topics i want to dive into today we'll keep it for a little bit later i want to stay on the on perspective more specifically now on your perspective on the strength and conditioning field the industry so what was your outlook on how things were viewed and done when you started and how has that evolved over time and where does that place us now in, in the, let's say in the evolution of the philosophy of strength conditioning? Yeah, I think, um, I remember after one of, it was like the first day of our seminar and we had a young strength coach that was at a D one school that came to one of our seminars and he was asking like, he was asking me advice on, on something programming wise. And I was just like, well, Hey, what do you think your athletes biggest limitation is, you know, across mm -hmm. the board team wise, what's your, what's your big limiter? And he thought about it for a little bit and he was like, it's the strength. And I was like, okay, well you must have like a team of all freshmen, low training age, right? Like if they're not strong and he goes, no, we're like, we're, you know, we've got a lot of upperclassmen, you know? And I was like, okay, well, so they've already been lifting with you for almost, you know, three two and a half, three years, and they're still not strong. Like you really think after all that time, like strength is their big limiter. Mm. And I think like as a, as a strength coach, it's, it's built in there. You just, Oh, okay. We got it. We got to get guys strong. And we're never like taking a step back. And there's always like, oh, how strong is strong enough for, you mm -hmm. know, this specific sport, right? But we're not even taking a far enough step back look to be like, wow, do what are my athletes' real limitations? You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Is it at the end of the fourth quarter, is it what that – is it the, the 50 pounds that I put on my guy's bench press, is that what's really limiting his performance? Mm -hmm. So I think right now it's, it's like – we don't have an effective way uh, across the board generally. I think if you go to like, if you visited every division one college strength coach in the country, uh, how do we evaluate our athletes to determine what their fundamental or their KPIs are, right? Mm -hmm. Stand past, say, you know, how do we identify these KPIs? So I'm actually, I, one, of my, one of my athletes is in the transfer portal right now. And we're trying to, you know, he's trying to, figure out where to go he goes what question should I ask my strength coach and I'm, I'm like ask him how he is going to evaluate you every day and then you know what what measures is he going to take mm -hmm. and I was like it can be a questionnaire you can jump on force plates but I'm hoping it's something objective are they are they going to be able to understand whether you're ready to train or not that day mm -hmm. um I feel like we're still fighting um uh, you know, I think we, we kind of get a, a bad rap because we use a lot of technology when we talk about like not overtraining people with some of these limiters. Hopefully we'll touch on that later because yeah. that's not the case. We want to mm -hmm. train. We want to 
train athletes out of limitations so that you can push them harder, faster, and stronger. But we still have that mentality globally that more is better. The, the harder that we can train every day is better. And I don't think we have an appreciation for how important uh, letting the body adapt to a certain stimulus is. Um, yeah, if we, can, if we can have a better understanding of our energy system development and the way our cell utilizes oxygen and how that bleeds into uh, rehab and training and nutrition, I think we as a profession would take a huge step forward. I think if we did a better job at, and it doesn't have to be like a crazy expensive technology, if we did a better job of like monitoring our athletes like daily, mm -hmm. um, not even daily, bi-weekly, monthly, you know, how are you gonna monitor your athlete and, and realize that every day might not be the best day for them to receive like this high intensity stimulus, you know, or, have an understanding that you know, them doing, you know, some low level cardio uh, can have positive heart adaptations. Mm -hmm. I feel like um, a lot of coaches might come in one day and watch me work with an athlete and see that, oh, well, why is this guy pedaling an extremely slow heart rate? Shouldn't we just be beating the shit out of him today? No, we're trying to get a left ventricle to, to stimulate. Mm -hmm. And that's the adaptation we're going for today. Um, instead of just, you know, this shotgun theory of like broad strokes, like I'm going to, I'm going to try to put everything in this program, just say, you know, let me pick the two greatest weaknesses that this one individual athlete has. Mm -hmm. And if I attack those two weaknesses, how much better I did, how much better did I get him globally? Or did I attack the one weakness that was the major determinant of his performance limitation? So just, I think the whole shotgun versus sniper rifle thing might be a good analogy here. Mm -hmm. uh, how can we be more direct with what we're actually prescribing? Yeah, I like that. And I want to come back to it after you mentioned the wellness questionnaire and how to essentially assess the readiness of, of athletes on a day-to-day, week-to-week basis. I, I feel like that is that is something that is fairly widely spread now, whether they do it through uh, some automated system or just a questionnaire. Uh, with a with a Z score and stuff like that, maybe within that realm, uh, what can still be improved? What what are maybe some of the, the the mistakes that coaches are still making, even though they are you know getting the athletes to fill out the questionnaires and they are checking the scores? What what's maybe missing in that in that way of of doing things? Uh, the first thing that comes to mind is is it would like <laughs> we have a client. This is a direct example. We have a client that like religiously checks his HRV. Mm -hmm. Right. And we're lucky enough to utilize the Omega wave system and mm -hmm. the team system. So we actually get a parasympathetic sympathetic score. And so I think that like the point I'm trying to make is don't put all your eggs in one basket. And because we're lucky that we have the Omega wave, but a lot of people are throwing all their eggs in this HRV basket and basically saying like, Oh, my, my HRV is higher. So that means I get to train more. You know what I mean? but they're not appreciating that it's actually a parasympathetic overshoot that mm -hmm. is worse for them than actually being having a greater sympathetic response. Like a sympathetic response is your body trying to mobilize energy. And that's a good thing. I would much rather have my athlete come in in a sympathetic state than a parasympathetic overshoot. Right. And so parasympathetic overshoot, you can kind of tag that along with people that might think of like just overtraining, you know, Mm -hmm. But it's the baby, the, the body's just trying to downregulate the system where with an athlete, I want him to be able to upregulate energy and bring intensity. And I think that's a, uh, that's a big disconnect that, okay, oh, my, my HRV is super high today. I should be able to train hard. No, you're actually just running yourself into the ground. Um, but as far as like, I mean, just do something, you know, a question, a questionnaire is fine. Mm -hmm. Um, but if you're going to do a questionnaire, like let the questionnaire lead you into just having more open communication with your athlete, you know, if that's all you have. Um, but also going to touch back on don't put all your eggs in, in one basket, you know, like if I so solely just focused everything on a mega wave, then uh, I might not train as much, 
you know what I mean? And I think that's why kind of we kind of almost developed this kind of like rundown where it's like, let's get an opportunity to look at all those functional systems, right? Mm -hmm. So if we, if we look at somebody's omega wave, we get a look at their heart and their brain, right? Are they going to be able, like, is their DC potential shot to hell? Meaning like, if I talk to them, they won't even be able to receive the information that I'm giving them. Or do they have some kind of emotional tension that's through the roof? You can look at somebody's DC potential on the omega wave. And I can't tell you how many times it's opened up conversations like, Hey man, like how you do like, Oh no. Like I had it last night. Well, you know, that's, that's good information for you to have. I might not want to kick the shit out of you if you had like some type of trauma last night and you're really struggling. Mm -hmm. So DC potential, uh, that, you know, checks, checks the brain box, checks the heart box. Are those two good to go? Then we can use the moxie to basically look at, okay, is the tissue okay? Because you can have somebody who's amazing, their heart's ready to go, their brain is ready to go, but their tissue's shot to hell. Mm. So we use the moxie and basically say, okay, can we clear the fact that this muscle tissue can utilize oxygen, uh, recover their oxygen level, and be able to repeat bouts? Or is the tissue damaged, right? Mm. Do we need to look at different recovery protocols for the tissue? So I think like right now, the, the system we have is, is pretty good in the fact that we're just kind of checking those global boxes, you know, brain, heart, tissue. Okay, they're all good. Let's beat the hell out of you. You know what I mean? Let's, let's go after an adaptation that we really want to drive. Mm -hmm. um, and it, does everybody have the capability to do that? No, I'm just telling you that that's where, we, where you're at. And, you know, we did it that way because we don't want to put all our eggs in the moxie bucket. We don't want to put all our eggs in the omega wave bucket. You know, so uh, if you can find some diversity there and basically say like, well, even I did a questionnaire and I can follow up with a guy or talk to him for five minutes before whatever you got to do. But I, I think in this day and age, like we owe it to our athletes, um, especially at a big university to try to get some piece of technology that can kind of check on these guys on a daily basis. Mm. Um, I think it's the least we can do for them um that we focus more on taking care of them both on and off the court and sometimes these monitoring tools help us with off the court stuff you know yeah i think what you said about you know not putting all your eggs in one basket makes a lot of sense it's it's easy with the gadgets and like you said the technology that we have available to be over reliant on one which gives you kind of a myopic view of, of all things when really we should we should be the ones keeping the, the holistic approach, the over the oversight on all the different elements that influence somebody's uh, status, health, performance. Uh, and, and so in that regard, you know, not going too narrow with what you choose to, to, to use to measure is really important. One last question on this kind of a broader topic of SNC philosophy. You, you mentioned energy system development. What are the coaches missing today, let's say in the the common curriculum of, of education regarding conditioning what is what is missing there for coaches to better understand how things work because to my my understanding is that the methods that exist currently uh they all work for for some people more than for others obviously uh that, that gets into the limiters and stuff but the, the protocols the methods they work it's it's really the underlying physiology that we just had misunderstood uh, simply due to lack of precision of our measuring tools, really. Uh, but now we've come kind of full circle and we have a better understanding of what happens at a, at, a, at a more microscopic level. What do the coaches need to appreciate to still use those methods that do work, that do exist and that, do, that are effective, but while you know, maybe adding some nuances that this kind of new model of bioenergetics brings? Great. Wow. Okay. Uh, I think the, the first thing is we need to have a respect for the amount of time that our athlete needs to recover. Hmm. Okay. So we might be jumping ahead on what you want to get on, but we already know that almost every athlete that's ever come to us has some form of a respiratory limitation, right? Hmm. So, you know, having an athlete do 30 seconds off, 30 seconds off, like what's your goal there? conditioning wise, you know, if it's, if your goal is to, uh, you know, basically train survival, maybe your goal is, you know, maybe you're coming off of an injury and you want to 
build capillary density in the tissue. Okay, great. That's, that's what, if that's what you're going after and you know, that's what you're going after, then that's phenomenal training. You know what I mean? Mm. But realize that that's going to have a cost. Now, if you're doing that kind of training every day, what, what, it, what's going to be the cost of that? You're not going to get a great adaptation there. Mm. Um, so we need to appreciate that if you are going to do work like that, then give your athletes the necessary time that they need to recover in between bouts. Because at least in, in my humble opinion, it's for us, it's a lot about quality repetitions, right? And you can't maintain quality repetitions in a survival state. Survival means low oxygen state within the tissue. So I would say make sure your athletes, give them ample time to recover. Keep quality super high. Um, the other thing that you want to think about is that we haven't seen an athlete really be able to effectively utilize oxygen uh, for longer than 20 seconds plus or minus three. So if you're having them sprint for 30 seconds, know that that's the adaptation you're going after. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. but Hey, you know, your kid might've gotten in trouble and they might've been out late and might've been partying and you want to beat the hell out of them. So, Hey, that's, that'll fit. That'll work really well. But if you're looking for a specific adaptation, you've got to appreciate that, we might need to change our time domains when it comes to work rest ratios. Uh, if you don't have something, I'm, I'm not, at least now, I'm not the strength coach that just wants to kind of guess and throw darts at a wall. You know, I want to know, okay, wait, now I need to stop them now. And it's as simple as that. Like, I'd rather not guess. I'd rather just know. And that's one advantage of having a moxie is that I don't have to guess on when my athletes recovered and I don't have to, guess when I should stop that bout, you know, it might be 10 seconds that day. It might be five seconds that day. And, but that's okay because my quality of work is still high and mm -hmm. I'm not putting a load on an athlete that they can't recover from. Cause what's the, what's the point of that? You know, mm -hmm. I want, I want my athletes to, I think that's why we see so much of athletes really not improving year to year mm -hmm. because we're just forcing this adaptation that isn't even physiologically possible for them and being, and, and it's basically the strong will survive, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so hopefully that answers, answers your question. Now, those are, those would be my two big, big rocks, recovery time uh, and rest intervals. Yeah. Like the, the recovery time, I took a page out of Brian's book on that one and recently started doing um, the, or let's say that on, on say sprint intervals, on the on the the airdyne for example uh, trying to get max watts uh, before it was pretty straightforward to do oh you know what let's do six seconds on two minutes off because that's just what you read in the book right uh, mm -hmm. what i've shifted towards is a bit more flexible in the sense that let's just go until we see a peak wattage on the bike and then as soon as that peak starts to drop we stop and then the recovery is when your respiration is back to baseline and that, and that's what tells you, Hey, I'm ready to go for the next one. And, and I find that it, it, it's, it's less quote unquote structured or no, it's, that's not true. The, the structure is different because there is still our parameters to stop and start, but now it's based on what you see on the monitor and what you see on the client or the athlete, rather than those arbitrary numbers that we we're used to throwing at the wall. And I find that that brings some, uh, an interesting way of, of looking at training and, and it also forces or pushes the client or the athlete to be more in tune with himself or herself rather than just saying, well, that's it, two minutes. And then whether, you, whether you're ready or not, you could have been ready after one minute, 30 seconds. You, maybe you need three minutes after this one because we've done you know, five or six beforehand. Uh, it, it gives a bit more um, responsibility to the athlete or the client. And that, that alone I find really interesting. Yeah, because – as you already know that you learned from Brian is that the respiratory system and your breathing is going to be the last thing to recover. Mm -hmm. So even, even I feel like it would put the onus back on you if you have a team of guys out there and you guys are doing conditioning together and you'd be like, Hey, you're gonna, you're gonna rest until your breathing's recovered. And you've got like 10 guys that after, you know, a minute 40, they're ready to go. And then you've mm -hmm. got another group of guys that's three minutes in and they're still having them puffing, you know? So I, I think if I was a strength coach, I'd be like, man, what's going on with this group? Mm. You know, is that a, is that a good thing that they're still breathing really hard three minutes after the, you know, the third sprint? Is that good or is that bad? I mm. think that's it's probably not good, you know? So how can I, how can I go about fixing that? You know? The next thing I wanted to talk about was 
this this triad that keeps coming back when I when I listen to you guys or watch any of your content. The first time I saw that, uh, it stood out when I watched one of Aaron's presentations that he did for the Moxie uh, Moxie Monitor YouTube channel, and this triad keeps coming back and seems to be the underlying dynamic behind so many things, whether it's in the human body or outside. What I'm talking about is the three elements or a triangle formed by the three elements of structure, function, and energetics, uh, which is kind of deeply embedded in the philosophy of, of, of what you guys do at Evolve HP. So can you, can you talk about this, these three elements, what they mean, and then how they, um, they apply to everything that we do? Yeah. So let's, let's talk about like structure first. So mm -hmm. if, if you think about the triad, each of them are just as important as all the others. There's no, that's more important than the other and they all affect each other. Mm -hmm. uh, so somebody's structure, most likely we're thinking about things and at least from our philosophy, we steal from the osteopathic community. And then we also steal from the PRI community to try to get a sense as to where these what are these individual joints? Were they kind of relative to one another? And then what are those joint ranges of motion? Uh, and then that, I, as I kind of explain to people, that gives us, you know, we do some table tests, we kind of feel, we palpate, and we're, that kind of gives us like a blueprint of where that person's body is. And going back to don't put all your eggs in one basket, I can't tell you how many times that I have looked at somebody structurally and thought that I would see something uh, off table and it's completely different. And that kind of leads us right into function. So how does our body take this structure and these joints in these different relative uh, positions and how does it get affected by gravity, ground reaction force and mass and momentum, which are um, the great institute, the applied functional science those are their fundamental principles and because they're principles of physics and mm -hmm. those are constants throughout every athlete. So how does our body take this structure and then deal with it with those uh, demands? And sometimes you see exactly what you see represented on the table and then sometimes you don't. And then it's our job to figure out the why. Mm -hmm. uh, the last one is the energetic piece, which I'll try to keep it simple for everybody. It's just how does our body utilize oxygen? right? How does our body utilize fuel? And when you start putting those together, I'll give you, I'll give you an example of a, let's say like a hamstring, a hamstring injury. So we might look at, you know, let's say you have a left hamstring and you get an MRI and it's a grade two tear. Um, we're going to want to go through in the rehab process and look at all three of these pillars, right? Cause they're all going to be incredibly important to the rehab process. So from a structure perspective, we're going to look at the pelvis, the knee, and the ankle joint and say, okay, where are these in relative space? Actually, we're going to go ahead and look at the entire body, but just for the example's sake, let's mm -hmm. say that we've got that left pelvis that's in a drastic state of flexion, right? And so because that pelvis is in that relative state of flexion compared to the, on the left compared to the right, we know that that left hamstring's length tension relationship, it's gonna be eccentrically oriented, okay? And that's not the best for loading, right? If we look at it from a functional perspective, we might see that that athlete's limited in that left hip internal rotation, right? So therefore, from a, from a three-dimensional standpoint, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of people that are taking the, the 3D movement in a bunch of different directions, but I'll try to keep it simple for everybody. Mm. Um, but you, ha you, know, you have your sagittal, frontal, and transverse planes, and the hamstring is dominated by transverse plane motion and orientation. So if you have somebody that's limited in that left hip internal rotation, they're not going to be able to load that hamstring effectively. So we're looking at an athlete who has a length tension relationship issue, uh, an eccentrically elongated uh, position of that tissue and it can't load in three-dimensional movement effectively either. So for the most part, I feel like, you know, you go to, to different people, you know, and they might, one might have like a PRI background, one might have like a movement background and there's people that get tremendous success with, you know, focusing on one of those two buckets. And 
there are practitioners that are way better than me that specialize in one bucket that can probably get it done, but I'm not that good. So I want to try to say, well, if I check the structure, right, and I can change that position of that pelvis from so dumped anteriorly, and if I can bring that back a little bit and reestablish that length tension relationship, mm -hmm. that might really help the injury. Furthermore, movement, if I can reestablish some hip internal rotation, right, and even through the therapy, load that hamstring authentically in all three planes, then that might help, you know. But the thing I always forgot about was the fact that I never appreciated how that hamstring was utilizing fuel. Because I can rehab it. I can get it stronger. You know what I mean? I can work on the proprioceptive aspects of that tissue. But at the end of the day, if it's starving for energy, when you put it back out on the field, it's not going to go well. And I feel like it is the, the, the best example is the athlete that, you know, can do a couple of sprints and they're feeling good and they're just kind of like, okay, he looks great. You know what I mean? Let's, let's check, uh, let's check the, let's say that athlete is even they're utilizing dual force plates with this athlete, right? Mm -hmm. Super high tech dual force plates look great. Numbers look great. Strength numbers, everything's good, but they send them out there. And then the last five minutes of the match game, whatever injury, injury happens again. Right. The athlete's strong enough, you know, their, their numbers look good, mm -hmm. you know, but that athlete's tissue was in an eccentrically oriented position and that position isn't going to lend itself to that tissue utilizing oxygen effectively. Mm -hmm. So at least in our head, we want to try to understand what are the biogenic bioenergetic limiters of that tissue, right? Is it neurological? Do they, is it an occlusion trend that we're seeing? Right. Meaning like you have three, three kinds of occlusions you have, or two, you have compression, which is exactly what we want. That's optimal coordination, mm -hmm. right? Muscle contracts, releases, lets blood flow back in. That's awesome. You want to do that all the time, right? Then you've got a venous occlusion, which is one side clamps down and then the arterial occlusion, both sides, right? We can think of from a simple side of things for, for the strength coach out there that a compression is them to, you know, doing squats at like 30%. They should be able to knock those out, no problem, right? Then you have a venous occlusion, that's like 55%, a little bit heavier, you know what I mean? Then the arterial occlusion, that's your one rep max. Boom, you're getting everything you can out of there. Do you want your athlete running down the field with a hamstring that's at one rep max the whole time. No, mm -hmm. an injury might occur. And so we, we never really think to like check that box. Okay. Neurologically what's going on. Does the muscle have optimal coordination or does it not? And the Moxie monitor helps us check that box. Then can the muscle utilize oxygen, right? When that muscle and tissue does work, does oxygen go down and, and then does it come back up? Right. So if we see that a tissue can't utilize oxygen, that is definitely going to be a problem late in a game, right? Mm -hmm. So if we can look at an injury like a hamstring and we can say, hey, let's treat the hamstring from a positional standpoint. Can we treat the hamstring from a functional movement standpoint? And can we treat it from an energetic standpoint? Yes, we can. I feel like you're going to have a lot more success if you're checking all those boxes. But definitely, I think, We've got so many practitioners that do one of those or even a lot of them do two of those really, really well. And I think traditional rehab is just missing the bioenergetic piece, mm -hmm. um, especially from like even even more specifically, like think about the bioenergetic treatments that we can do. You know, uh, there's already great research on BFR and, it, and its benefits, mm -hmm. but most people don't realize that you can manipulate you know, some people are already doing BFR all the time, you know, and, and that's not appreciated. And then by attacking your respiratory system, you can, you know, utilize BFR. By attacking your resp respiratory system, you can take an ankle injury that's swollen and you can create a vasodilation.
that allows you to push more blood flow to that area. And then that'll allow you to gain more of that three-dimensional movement that you want and reestablish uh, some of that. And then you can, like the ankle sprains is a, is a, is a good example because we can, can look at structure, right? What is the structural foot type? Okay, well, this person had an inversion ankle sprain. Well, they're already in an inverted position in the rear foot. Okay, so that kind of predisposes them. Do we give them an orthotic to help them go through more pronation so they have more three-dimensional motion available? We could do that, you know. Can we do manual therapy to, you know, help the subtalar joint evert in the front leg and gait? Yeah, we can do that. But what are we going to do about this swelling? You know what I mean? That swelling is going to kind of limit us. Well, we can have the person go hypoxic while we're doing the movement therapy, and we can kill two birds with one stone, right? And so I, and, and that's like one of the bioenergetic pieces that, you know, I never thought about, you know, a couple of years ago, didn't have any appreciation for when it came to like return to play or, or anything like that. But you can take that example of looking at those three and take it to the, take it to the training floor. You know, it, mm. at the end of the day, it, it works in almost every situation because they're all just fundamental. It's, it's physics, fundamental laws of the human body. I want to talk about manual therapy a little bit. You mentioned it a couple times from, you know, all the, I watch a lot of videos and back in the day when I was doing some weightlifting, I remember watching the Russians in their, their Olympic training hall. And there was always a manual therapy or a massage hall directly attached to the training hall. And the guys seamlessly went from lifting platform to get a massage, to come back. Um, I remember Charlie Francis talking a lot about the importance of the the chiros that he worked with, uh, the physios, uh, and that essentially he could use manual therapy on his sprinters to modulate um, kind of neural tension, muscle tension, those kind of things to to make sure that they were right where he wanted them to be to to produce the most force for that day. Um, I, I feel like manual therapy might be a little bit put to the side in the training world, although for you, it does seem like it is a very important piece and, and kind of a one of the components of what you do on a daily basis with your clients. So can you talk a bit about that integrating manual therapy into coaching and training? Um, well, I can't talk about this without first mentioning Dan Path. He was the one that has had the most influence on me when it comes to seeing that kind of trackside therapy mm -hmm. um, mentality and uh, what's amazing about Dan is he's got like some of the best eyes you could ever imagine. Um, I'll tell you a quick, a quick story about Dan. We did a, uh, we did a seminar here in Austin, uh, just me and Aaron, and we brought on in some other coaches and we had Dan speak and I wanted to talk about evaluation of movement and gait analysis and, you know, blending this stuff that you see on the table with functional movement screens and like putting it all together. And Dan like is in the back of the room and he's got a newspaper. It might not have been a newspaper. He was reading something. Obviously Dan doesn't need to pay attention to what I'm saying. He knows all this stuff already. Right. <laughs> and so I got this person that volunteered and we did an assessment and they're walking back and forth and I'm trying to just get people to like, Hey, what do you see? Oh, I see, you know, is that person's limited in ankle dorsiflexion? Yes. No. Do they lack rotation? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I'm getting like crickets from the crowd. Nobody wants to say anything. So I'm trying to, I'm like, come on guys. Like, it's okay. Like just say whatever you want. And Dan like peeks up from when he's reading and he's like, C6 is rotated to the left. <laughs> well, I was like, like, okay, well, anybody have anything to add after that? You know, like I was looking for something, yeah. you know, he's got <laughs> such an amazing eye. And I think, um, I think like that's where kind of like the blend really is. Like that's what you're after is the ability to see human movement and to feel human movement with your mm -hmm. hands um and say you know is there a limitation here is this is this kind of where it's supposed to be um and then you can you can find a way to do your your proper intervention um i think that uh there are definitely there are definitely huge pros and cons to like manual therapy like people one people love it you know what i mean but you also 
you can get dependent on it. People, mm -hmm. people like it. They'd rather lay down on the table and have you, you know, manipulate them or do whatever it is instead of going out there and, and doing work. So I think that it's something that we're even trying to work on. Um, and it's a constant battle of once you get somebody, let's say, you know, our thought process of manual therapy is that we want to try to reestablish proper joint position to allow for three-dimensional movement to occur at a joint, right? Mm -hmm. And if we can, like, for example, take that pelvis and pull it back, that the flex pelvis example, if we can change that orientation, that opens it up. But there's a whole neurological component that you have to appreciate. And I feel like that's grossly underappreciated. Like to think that you make adjustments to somebody's body on a table and then have them stand up and have to deal with those effects of gravity and they're just going to walk and it's just going to hold where you think it's going to hold. You're, you're wrong about that definitively mm -hmm. because you're, the brain doesn't know how to snatch 135 pounds in the new position that you gave it. So what do you think it's going to do? It's going to go right back to where it was. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that while manual therapy like has all kinds of pros and cons, like it's, it's still a balancing act between all the other stuff that you need to do. But uh, there are definitely some cases that I feel like, you know, especially I'm horrible at remote programming, you know, and Aaron is like one of the best at it. So I'm like, I don't even touch it. And it's hard for me when I'll get calls from athletes that I work with and they're like, Hey, can, you know, can, can you, can you do that move on me? And I'm like, no, you got to go do your corrective exercises and stay on top of it. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? You got to make sure that your, your form stays good. So there's a, there's a lot that goes into it that I don't, I think people are just like, Oh, we'll just throw them on the table and, you know, give them some manual therapy and everything be okay. I think it's just, it's just one of the pieces of the puzzle. Um, and when you put it in right, it, it works phenomenally. But I think there's always a balancing act that you're doing between like not doing too much or not doing too little. Um, it's, it's without a doubt an art form in itself that I'll spend the rest of my life trying to figure out. Um, there, there are some amazing uh, osteopaths out there, and I've been lucky to, to spend a lot of time with, with one of them. And we're talking about a classically trained osteopath. So that's somebody whose whole goal is to, you know, manipulate the body for health and manipulate joint position for health. And I feel like that is something that's totally lost here in the United States. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously there's practitioners that do amazing manual therapy, but uh, when it comes to like classical osteopathy, that's, that's not something that you find in, in every city. Um, but I think just the level um, and how attuned they are at, you know, feeling somebody's tissue, feeling a joint, um, those are all skills that all strength coaches like can benefit from. And I think that, there is a fine line that where we need to be careful as far as like touching our athletes, um, especially in this day and age, but there's definitely a uh, value, especially from an assessment standpoint mm -hmm. to understanding what injured tissue feels like understanding, you know, what quality tissue feels like uh, being able to just to touch an athlete and be like, you know what, this feels pretty dehydrated. How many beers did you have last night? <laughs> like that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely a, a piece of the, of our philosophy, but it's definitely, it's not the, it's definitely not the whole pie. It's not the end all be all, but it's a, it's a good tool to, to utilize in certain situations. For coaches who are interested in learning more about manual therapy and maybe be able to use it to a certain extent with their athletes or clients, uh, obviously without going beyond the scope of practice, what might be a good way to get into it without having to go through a whole a manual therapy curriculum, you know, studies, years and years, all those kind of things is uh, obviously there's, it's kind of a loaded question because I don't want to make it seem like it's such a, an easy thing to do that you could just pick it up with a side course or with an online course. You need hands on, you need to learn from people who know what they're doing because you can obviously do some damage uh, if you're not careful. But so what, what is, what, what is the right way to get into the manual therapy as a strength and conditioning coach? Um, it's definitely, it's not really, to be honest, a question I should even be answering, but, um, 
I think that uh, I'd have to give credit where credit is due, like Lenny Parasino. Uh, he's the main therapist for the Los Angeles Clippers right now. He mm-hmm. played a huge role in my understanding of fascia, the way the body moves and how manual therapy fits into that. Uh, I personally think he's, he's one of the very best. Um, and then even, even doing something as like reading like old osteopathy books, like some of the, some of the stuff that AT still was talking about a long time ago is Mm -hmm. still very relative to, to working with athletes today. Um, and then I think just finding somebody who you think does good work and, and maybe doing it some type of like internship with them. Like I said, like when I started this thing, like I, I, I just spent time around really good people. So find somebody good and then watch the way that they touch people. You know what I mean? Watch, watch where they place their hands. You know, there's a big difference between like evaluating somebody and poking them like this, like this tells you no story whatsoever. This tells you a story about what's going on, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so little things like that kind of go a long way. Obviously, like you should probably get licensed to do it, you know, right. um, which that's what, I mean, that's the basic recommendation, but I definitely think that we have had multiple coaches license in some form of therapy, but have no skills when it comes to actually feeling and uh, evaluating an athlete, right? Mm. Uh, there's, a, there's an art form to that too. So every every time that you, you know, even when you're checking uh, shoulder internal rotation, external rotation, you're going to, you're going to touch their arm, you're going to feel some tissue. And that's an evaluation opportunity. So mm. don't, don't think just because you're not doing broad, broad strokes up against somebody's leg, you know, that you're not being able to evaluate tissue safely. No, that's, that's a good point. Another piece of the puzzle that you mentioned already, and I know that you have a lot of interest uh, for is the, the respiratory system, a topic that I'm diving into now, trying to better understand. So like you said, uh, Brian Kozak was a big influence in, in you know, helping you understand uh, the that system alongside obviously Aaron and, and, and others uh, f- for you, how important is the respiratory system in the, in the big picture, in the grand scheme of things, given your current, let's say perspective on the human body and health and performance. Okay. So I'll, I'll give you two stories. One, it's probably one of the hardest things for me to do to is watch, uh, MMA. Mm-hmm. and watch these MMA athletes and it's so blatant that they have respiratory limitations it's hard to watch and Aaron loves MMA and just to watch the way that like they are cueing them to breathe incorrectly you know what I mean in their corners right mm-hmm. they are they're on the floor and you you're you're watching somebody like from the first round to literally the third round and they're a completely different fighter you know what I mean? Um, and so that, that's just a, an example. The first thing where I'm like, Oh my God, like you're just watching the whole thing. Like this dude's got a respiratory limitation and he doesn't even realize it, you know? And it's cause nobody talks about it. And then the second example I would give is like, I can't tell you how many times I'm watching, you know, college football on TV or NFL football on TV. And it's the fourth quarter. There's two minutes left. And at the first of the game, the announcers are talking about the star defensive lineman who's projected to be, you know, one of the top picks. And, Mm. oh, my God, this guy bench presses 500 pounds, and he's going to be amazing. But in the fourth quarter, when the team needs to win, and it's like fourth and one, that guy's on the sidelines, like, sucking wind. You know what I mean? And that's when it really hits me that I'm like, man, like, this respiratory training is super important. And I'll, I'll tell kids like, you want to win games, you got to train your guys' respiratory system because not too many games are won in the first quarter or first half. They're won at the end. And like to tag on that with some actual science is like, hey, there's this thing called the metabolic reflex that is a natural survival mechanism that we have. So the heart is distributing blood to the diaphragm, right? The diaphragm is, is highly underrated 
it's probably you got the heart and the diaphragm's like right underneath it. Okay, mm -hmm. the diaphragm has the diaphragm affects digestion. The diaphragm affects respiration. The diaphragm affects posture. Right? How many other muscles can you think of in the human body that that are that diverse, mm -hmm. and we don't train it? Right? Well, we do, but not everybody. <laughs> <laughs> So you got this incredibly complex and diverse muscle, right? And it's getting blood from the heart. And then the periphery, arms, legs, what people are running around with. Mm -hmm. If the respiratory system starts to fatigue, if the diaphragm starts to fatigue, the body will shunt blood away from the extremities and push it towards the respiratory system, right? Mm -hmm. Because the body's pretty smart. And it's like, well, if the respiratory system completely fatigues and stops, then you're gonna die. So we wanna stop that. A lot more important than your legs continuing to go. So I can't, I can't help but to think about situations where you've got guys and me and Aaron have gone to a top 10 at the time, division one basketball institution where we have seen a basketball player that had issues with cramps, right? And they're sending them to Gatorade Institute. They're doing all kinds of things. <laughs> but at the end of the day, if you guys got a respiratory limitation and to finish the understanding of the reflex, when the body shunts the blood to the extremities and forces it to the respiratory system, you get occlusions at the extremities. Mm -hmm. And so that athlete wasn't having trouble with hydration. He was having an occlusion trend. So if you have an occlusion, especially in arterial occlusion and you compress and you don't let blood in there, guess what? No fuels get in there either. And you can cram. So how many guys do you see at the end of a game match, they cramp up, they, you know, they rest, they give them some water. It was it really that they, the extra the Gatorade that they needed or did their respiratory system need to recover? Right? So it doesn't matter whether that's the other beautiful thing. It doesn't matter what sports you play. You rock climb. Breathing's involved, right? Mm -hmm. You play, you're a defensive lineman in American football. Breathing is involved, right? It, it almost doesn't matter. And, and that's the, what Brian's so brilliant at explaining to people is just the importance of breathing. And it just kind of, even when I, like I said, to, to touch on the story from before, I was just like, man, I don't have time to train that breathing thing. But now I'm like, I want to win games. I want to blow people out of the water, right? I want to have a situation where my head coach knows that they have an advantage over the opposition. If they call a timeout, their athletes can fully recover their oxygen levels due to the fact that my athletes don't have a respiratory limitation. They can recover their oxygen levels back up to full. Mm -hmm. Think of like a fuel tank. My guys go out there and play for five minutes. Notice how coaches, like, they start to see play go down, and they're like, uh-oh, my guys are tired. Our defense looks like shit. Call a timeout real quick. Let's get them some rest. Well, those athletes that have a respiratory limitation, that 30-second timeout, they're not able to fully recover. But if I have a team and all my guys don't have respiratory limitations, in fact, their respiratory system is a weapon that allows them to recover faster than the other team, then when they go back out, what do you think is going to happen? Then the next time out is called, the next time out is called, and it compounds itself. And then you have one team that is in, in a high oxygen utilization state at the end of the game versus another team that's at a low oxygen state. And guess what? You need oxygen to produce power. So as much as any coach wants to be like, oh, well, that oxygen thing doesn't apply to me. Yes, it does. Because you can't produce maximum power output without oxygen available in a cell. Right. Hmm. So if you're in this fatigue state and you're having your athlete sprint for 35 seconds, he's never going to be able to sprint faster the last five seconds because he doesn't have an effective fuel source available. This is tying right back around to where, why is it important to understand what's going on in a cell? Because the more that you understand it, the more you start to realize, man, there's all these different variables that are super important that are going to allow my athlete to keep going, especially later on. doesn't matter whether they're a strength and power athlete or an endurance athlete. Right. So that's kind of the, the short end of the story of like, why, why I feel like training the respiratory system is important is because there is a absolute, you know, there's a survival mechanism that our body has that you can't refute. doesn't matter how strong you get your athlete. 
at the end of the day, if his respiratory system fatigues, which is a system that you never train, right? He's going to have issues with fatigue and performance in his extremities because the body's going to shunt blood to the diaphragm because it's more important to survive and keep breathing than it is to keep your legs moving, right? And it'd be the same example as if like you had an athlete that had never lifted weights, right? Think if we had teams of guys that never lifted any weights, zero training age, right? And they only, they only focused on their respiratory system, right? And you had a whole bunch of guys that are like, you know what? These guys just need to do more respiratory work. No, you'd look at them and be like, none of those guys can even squat their body weight. It might be advantageous for us to have them do some squats under load. They mm -hmm. might get a little stronger. Might help with injury prevention. It's the same thing we just looked around. You're seeing all these athletes that have these respiratory limitations, and all we're doing is just trying to get them stronger. We're not, we're not really appreciating that, hey, you know – that athlete could be able to reproduce the 350 bench press over and over and over again through four quarters if he was able to refuel his oxygen level by using his respiratory system. But we're, we're not quite there yet, but I hope, I hope very soon that we will be. Uh, yeah. when, you, when you mentioned the MMA, I remember a, a podcast where uh, Kron Gracie talks with uh, Joe Rogan. And they go at length on, Kron talks about it uh, extensively on how he uses respiratory training to better control his, uh, he talks about his diaphragm, what he, he can, you know, do the, bring the, the stomach in and move it around and, and all those uh, quote unquote funky things. But he talks about how important it is for him to manage his fatigue, uh, you know, when he's maybe underneath someone or uh, getting, you know, uh, when he when he's in a, in a compromised position let's call it like that uh, just to make sure that he doesn't lose any uh, too much energy you know trying to maintain this position and how big a role it, it does play in his overall mental status as well where if you like brian says if you don't control your your breathing your breathing will control you and and which especially applies when you're like you said you know end of a game end of a long play uh, in a in a you know combat situation like in MMA, all those things are highly stressful situations. And if you don't have the control over how you breathe, you don't have control over how you think, and that could mean the end, right? Yeah, and I think one thing that I do want to touch on when it comes to breathing is some of the devices out there for breathing are like laughable, right? So just keep in mind if you're a coach out there and you are interested in training breathing, you do need a device that trains the inhale and the exhale. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That'd be buying a dumbbell and only being able to eccentrically load yourself with the dumbbell. Like you wouldn't want to do that. You'd want to be able to do both because mm -hmm. both are important. And there's multiple reasons why both are important. Even from this is a tie into structure function and bioenergetics. So you have an athlete that has a, infrasternal angle or a structure, right? That's a whole nother rabbit hole about infrasternal angle, but their structure could limit them in inhalation or limit them in exhalation, right? right? And then you might want to train an athlete and focus on expansion in different areas of their body, right? That way they're not have different areas that are completely compressed. You can also, so that's looking at the structure side. Then the function side of the breathing is, does my athlete fatigue at a respiratory rate, right? So I might have an athlete that as soon as their respiratory rate hits 35 breaths per second, the wheels fall off, right? Mm -hmm. So can I functionally train them to coordinate their breathing at higher respiratory rates so they don't fatigue, right? And that metabol reflex doesn't kick in, right? Yeah, for, maybe and, for, and, for those who want to understand that a little bit better, there's a great presentation, again, on the Moxie YouTube channel. Uh, it's a presentation about using uh, MOXIE and VO2 assessment for a, a full a picture. And uh, Dan talks about that uh, respiratory frequency, tidal volume, mid ventilation, and the relationship between those three. And like you said, when you some people, when you hit a certain uh, respiratory rate, you can't co coordinate your, your respiration anymore. Tidal volume drops, which means that your mid ventilation is going to drop. And then 
again, there's not enough fuel, like you said, not enough O2 coming in, and that's kind of the end of the game. So I think that that's really interesting for those who want to dig into it. Go go check that out. Um, sorry, I cut you off. Go ahead. No, I and I was just going to – so, yeah, if you if we want to just focus on uh, – having the, the coordination aspect mm -hmm. is huge and there there's devices out there that do the strength aspect. Is that important? Absolutely. But, uh, things like the elevation mask drive me nuts. You know, <laughs> if, if you want to take somebody with a respiratory limitation and make it worse, that's one way to do it. Are you going to get benefits from probably some induced hypoxia? Absolutely. But, uh, we want to be careful about when we do that and when we don't, mm -hmm. Um, and you know, there are devices out there that just train like, you know, this single rep hard exhale, like that's probably not going to work either. Right. You, you're going to want to train the respiratory system and get it close to mimicking the fatigue markers that it's going to see like during the end of a game. So mm -hmm. take guys out. Can you, can you train on that thing for, for 20 minutes? And I mean, I, I can't help. We're kind of, I'm kind of plugging our own deal here, but that's what got us into the, our device, the NX, which is in a way that we can train the respiratory system uh, because we can train in coordination, right? We can do, I, I had an athlete that came in today that we did 20 minutes at 40 breaths per minute on a four liter bag, you know? So we can, we can take somebody and play a whole basketball game through breathing. Mm. Um, we can increase their tidal volume by doing strength work. We can improve their, make changes to their structure by pushing air into cavities that are compressed. Um, and all these, all these things that all tie into to, to the breath, you know, and tie into the diaphragm. And the diaphragm, like I said earlier, was one of the most versatile muscles in the human body. And the way that we can train breathing is incredibly versatile and has an impact on everything that we do. So that... I guess if there's one thing people can take away from this, it's that like having an appreciation for breathing in, in training, you know, mm -hmm. and rehabilitation and health. If there's, if there was ever time to think about breathing with all this COVID stuff right now, like in health, like, Hey, the better breather that you are might be a good thing with, this, with, the, with COVID going on right now. Mm -hmm. So it is a respiratory, it's a respiratory problem. And it just so happens that we don't have many people in within our population that we look at that come in that don't have a respiratory limitation. So, uh, I would, I definitely want to keep that, keep that in mind, you know? Mm -hmm. What, why do you think so few people actually talk about the respiratory system, uh, as such? I mean, it's, it, to me, it seems like from, from what I've read, and like you said, many, many people present with a respiratory limitation. There's, I definitely think that there's always, improvements that can be made, even if it's not a full blown limitation, like, uh, like you would see on a one, uh, five, one, five or something like that. Uh, but it does seem like usually those things present more often than not at higher intensities on continuous efforts. Uh, from what I read, it's about the thresholds around 80% of VO2 max for a sustained period of time. That's when you're really going to start to see the, the respiratory system fatigue. Uh, if, if it does, because for some people it, it doesn't do as much, or maybe other systems are limiting, limiting them. But what do you think that so few people actually talk about the respiratory system and, you know, the importance of training it, the importance of, uh, of assessing it as well, all those things? Well, honestly, like the first thing that comes to mind is just the, like, it's not traditional, hmm. you know, you really have to, like, if you, if you would have came, if, if you would have came to me when I was a collegiate strength coach and told me that, you know, the respiratory system was the thing that was limiting all my athletes performance, I'd tell you, get out of here. You know what I mean? Like, no way. Like I won a national championship at the university of Denver. Like don't come and tell me that, you know, I, I don't know what I'm doing, you know? <laughs> so I think there's a huge amount of like ego involved mm -hmm. and you, you got to be humble enough to, to go back and just understand the, the basic science behind how we utilize fuel. And I think like the more people that can get educated on just the fundamental basics, right? Right. Oxygen is going to get depleted right away as soon as our guys do any kind of exercise, right? How do we get oxygen back up so that we can produce that power again? 
through breathing. So it's pretty important that we train the breathing so they can refuel and go again and again and again and again and again. Mm -hmm. And I want athletes to be able to reproduce that power that I'm spending so much time developing. I want them to be able to reproduce it over time. And the only way to do that is to have a respiratory system that forget a limitation. Let's have a respiratory system that is a weapon, right? And so I definitely think there's some, there's some ego involved in it and believe it or not, like, you know, we're, we're definitely a culture that does not want to change, you know, given, you know, given your guys, like, you know, how can, how can you create and you know, that, that this breathing thing is important. I think, you know, first thought it's like, Oh, that's like yoga. That's, that's soft. That's, you know, that, that's not what, that's not what we're about here. But at the end of the day, if you're about winning games, that's what I would be about. You know, I, I, my, my logo would be whatever's going to help us win more games. Cause that's going to help me keep my job. And guess what? If, if breathing is going to help give my guys the most advantage possible, then that's what I'm going to do. And in actuality, if you go back to structure, function, bioenergetics, it could be a big role in why my athletes getting injured. You know, my number one job as a strength coach is to keep you on the field, keep you healthy. So if I got to use a breathing device to do it, I'm going to do it, you know? So I, I honestly, like, I, I don't have a better answer for you than that. I just, I think it's just simply lack of education and then uh, our egos kind of get in the way. Both you and I, uh, both you and Aaron, sorry, strike me as, people that are very well versed in all the performance and health research. What are some of the problems that you see uh, with sports science today? Um, I'm stealing this. This is Aaron kind of hits on this topic really well. Uh, I'm going to steal it from him, but I think that the one thing in sports science that is starting to really like gain momentum, especially in the United States, obviously like, uh, European soccer and Australian football have been doing a phenomenal job with GPS technology for mm -hmm. years, right? And it is becoming kind of more the gold standard that we have this piece of technology that is able to identify training loads. And we want to keep training loads below a certain level. And then we want to hit certain max intensities and so on and so forth. And it's incredibly valuable information. But as a strength coach, I would want to look at that information and say, over the course of me having an athlete for four years, have I increased the training load that he can handle, right? So if we're so worried about hitting a certain training load and then worrying about injury, what is the mechanism behind the injury, right? And so really just comes down to if we can start to identify our athletes performance limitations, then they can handle higher training loads and there isn't the injury risk. So it's like, we've, we have this amazing technology, this amazing system uh, that we can help, you know, guide athletes from, from getting hurt. And we're like, well, we'll just monitor everything globally and try to keep them under the threshold instead of like, don't worry about the threshold, train them out of the threshold, train them out of the limitation that's going to get them injured in the first place. Easier, obviously easier said than done, but um, I'm not in no way, shape or form I'm saying there's that GPS isn't valuable. I think it's incredibly valuable, but I think that that is something that we can use that we should be tracking our athletes every year that, wow, he can, as we take care of his respiratory limitation, as we improve his oxygen utilization, as he gets stronger, we see that he is able to handle higher and higher and higher training loads. Um, so, yeah, I think sometimes just me it's almost like you, you're measuring something for the sake of measuring something, you know, mm -hmm. which we kind of have to fall on that sword too sometimes um, because there is just, there is so much out there. But at the end of the day, you can do, all this amazing measurement but if you don't have a solution or an intervention to to fix that issue then then what are we what are we really doing 
if a guy constantly breaks down at this one training load, what are you going to bring his training load down? What are you going to tell your head coach? Like, yeah, uh, we're going to have to take him out 15 minutes early in practice. No, you're not going to do that. You know? Mm -hmm. So if I was a strength coach and I saw, wow, he's always getting injured at this training load besides monitoring, besides changing the load, which sometimes you're not in control over, what are you going to do? Find out what his performance limitations are and attack them. And then that training load will no longer be an issue. Yeah, that, make, that makes sense. Uh, so maybe to bring all the different puzzle pieces that we mentioned along the way here today, how do you approach uh, planning training for your, your athletes? That's something me and Aaron fight about all the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think that using the technology that we have, I've moved away from, you know, it's this on this day and more of, I basically break down the, I break down what I'm trying to attack with each workout, mm -hmm. right? What are, so I have to do an evaluation first. Once we evaluate now, we say, okay, these are the two biggest performance limiters that he has. These are the things that are holding him back. So I'm going to probably have two days that are solely focused to attacking the one and two other days to attacking the other. Now, every day that the athlete comes in, we get their omega wave and we say, okay, brain is good to go. Heart is good to go. We look at the moxie. Tissue is good to go. We can warm them up effectively, right? Let's hit them with, let's hit them with the high day. You know what I mean? Let's, let's, let's get after that specific adaptation that we want. It might be power development, right? Mm -hmm. um, it might be some form of sports specific conditioning that we want to do. Uh, but Let's attack that system and attack it really hard. Then when they come back the next day, we reevaluate. Oh, guess what? Brain's not so great today from that high output, high neurological day. Oh, tissue's actually kind of fatigued. So if brain's done, tissue's done, uh, heart's okay. Well, you know what? Let's do that left ventricle stimulation, you know? all oh, their, their heart profile wasn't quite where we want it for, you know, a strength and power athlete. Let's give more balance to it. Let's just train the left ventricle today. And so it slowly becomes this flow chart to where you have your adaptations. And then based off how the athlete presents, we can pick which adaptation he can best adapt to. I'm using that word, word twice, but if his heart's good to go and everything else is shot, Let's work on his heart. We know we can get that better today. Why take a day and if his tissue is already in a state of fatigue, which we can see from the moxie right away, why am I going to beat him up with, with general strength work? You know, that's just going to put him in the hole even further. And instead of just like, I plan out my, my two weeks and well, this is what we're doing today. So that's what we're doing. And the crazy thing is, is I'm not, I'm not, I can't even sit here and say that that doesn't work because it does. You know what I mean? I had tremendous success with it, you know, mm. but I can't help but to think how many times did I go after the adaptation that my athlete couldn't even adapt to. Mm. Uh, I think I did it a lot. And I think that I could have gotten so much more, especially out of some of those, like, you always have athletes on a team that are just amazing. You know what I mean? They're the best players on the team. But, like, what about the guys that just aren't quite there yet? They're, like, they're like almost there. And how many times did I run that guy into the, in, into the ground and then he had to go out to practice? Hmm. And he's just surviving all practice because of that's what I had written on the, for the day, you know? Um, so I think just more of, like, this flow chart – Whatever the athlete gives me on that day, that's what I attack. And the flow chart should manipulate itself as well. Because just like I was talking about the training load, when I have an athlete come in and we just might be doing like this generalized left ventricle work, if I improve that left ventricle and now that heart has better balance, it can handle more load. So now I'm going to push them harder and harder and harder. I think the biggest knock on the, on like, kind of like the moxie when people first start using it is, well, the, well, the athletes like it at first, 
the athletes are like, oh, this is great. I'm going to put this little monitor on and it's going to stop me. It's going to give me plenty of recovery time. It's fantastic. And then I get to breathe and it's great. It's super easy. Yeah, at first it's easy because we got to let the body have time to adapt to that new stimulus. But guess what? After about, <laughs> after about a couple of training sessions, when we start to get that adaptation, they see that little monitor come out and they're like, oh shit, I'm going to get my ass kicked today because we've let their body adapt to that training load and we've never put them in the hole. We never bury them. So every day they get a little bit better, a little bit better, a little bit better. And then before you know it, they're desaturating and reloading, desaturating and reloading. Like I, I, we have, we've got a couple athletes. In fact, I even have a, I've got a 55 year old CEO that can, uh, on a, on a, on a bicycle, he can fully desaturate and reload in under a minute. And he's, he's kind of, he's a CEO, he's kind of braggadocious. And he's basically just like, oh, you don't have enough time in the workout session. You know what I mean? I need more than an hour. You got to, you got to bring somebody else in to keep training me. He's been training with us for four years. He's, he's a tank, you know, mm -hmm. he can take, he can take a ton of, of high volume. So if you give the body the chance to adapt, it will give you bigger dividends down the road. We had a, we worked with a guy that went to the, try out for buds navy seals mm -hmm. right and that's like i think if if there's a population that is fun to train it's definitely like tactical you know what i mean you got to get those guys ready for anything and this we basically turned this dude into an absolute beast right and he went all the way through buds and the week before hell week so 12 weeks mm -hmm. so for 11 weeks he got his ass kicked and then his roommate got covid so they rolled him over and he had to start all over again Oh no! Then he went all the way through, and then made it through Hell Week. And I'm like, I don't even. I was like, I was like, man, I hope he can handle and handle all that. But like, you we start them small, and then we just constantly build them up, 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 and then he can handle insane training volumes. And but you have to be patient enough at first, and have the appreciation uh, for how the body actually adapts to a training stimulus. You got to have that appreciation first before you can, you can get there. Um, got to have the patience for it. So yeah, that's kind of the, the whole, the whole flow chart idea. What Still, I mean, go ahead. What, what are maybe some unconventional ways that you integrate respiratory training into training sessions with athletes or clients? Without an NX device that we use? With or without like how the, the, the whole, you know, breathing thing is obviously super wide and you can do it. Uh, many, many different ways, but how have you come to integrate some parts of it into training with clients uh, since you started using it? Well, it's, it, let's look at it from a, a triad perspective. So we can look at using the bag size as like a weight and we can either say, let's give somebody a big bag size because we want to put them in, in, over breathing or under breathing situation, they might need to be able to utilize oxygen today. So I give them a little bit bigger bag, they go a little bit hypoxic, um, or I might give them a small bag. Maybe they need to over breathe during the warm up to you know, bring their oxygen level to a higher state. So I can I can manipulate the bag uh, in the warm up. Mm -hmm. And I think that's real. I mean, a good warm up's undervalued. You know, we that's why we use the moxie. Okay, well, is he warmed up or is he not? Does the warm up work or does it not? Right. And so we, you, I use the restaurant device with almost everybody like in the warm up, um, and then you can do different. You know, you can you can do a little circuit and just throw them doing some type of speed breathing, uh, increased coordination. Throw it, throw it in the middle of it. Um, there's, I mean, you're, the the world is your oyster when it comes to to picking ways to to get creative with it. That's why we really want more and more people to become aware of it that way they can kind of put their own spin on, on how you can take this robust system and, and let it, let it fly. Uh, we're only scratching the surface of it to, to be honest. Uh, but what was the other piece of your question? No, that, that was exactly it. Maybe to give a, a practical case too, that I, that I saw recently on your Instagram working with a, with an athlete and she was doing the squats, heels, elevated squats, in a kind of a zercher position with cables. Yeah. 
while using a respiratory device. I'm not sure if it was a spiral or, or a DNX. Uh, so yeah. why, why would you want to use something like a respiratory training device, like one of those two, uh, during strength work? Or uh, I guess you could call it strength work or uh, repos- so that was more of a that was more of a rehab example. We were right. trying to put her in an optimal position um, where she could get posterior mediastinal expansion, mm-hmm. right? And sometimes um, athletes kind of instead of just inhaling through your nose, you by having to empty the respiratory bag, there's a level of resistance there that helps you kind of feel yourself almost pushing air in. Mm-hmm. And then you give that athlete a reference and it's like, mm-hmm. take air from the bag and push it into this area, take air from the bag, push it into that area. And you're mostly sending that to areas of the body that are compressed. Mm-hmm. Um, so like, like I said before, there's, there's so many different ways that you can use it. You can, I mean, the hypoxic training alone is so undervalued. Um, if you think about it, you know, everybody, all the strength coaches want to talk about like toughness, mental toughness training. You know what I mean? Like have somebody sit there and go hypoxic and then do push-ups, and then go hypoxic again and do push-ups and go hypoxic again. And you're actually increasing the athlete's ability to their threshold of CO2. So the first time that we have an athlete do the CO2 work, it's like they start panicking. You know what I mean? And you've got an SpO2 sensor right on their finger, right? And it's like, you're not going to die. You're not going to pass out. you got plenty of oxygen. It's just that they don't have any threshold for it. What do you think happens in a game, right? So your athlete gets under fatigue. CO2 gets built up. They have a respiratory limitation. They can't blow out the CO2 fast enough, right? And their brain's like, uh-oh, we're under fatigue. Well, what if I was able to train an athlete to become comfortable in that situation, right? So their fatigue marker not only gets delayed, right? But when it comes, they're used to it. It's okay. Okay. What's going on? I need to focus on my exhale, right? I think if you don't, if you don't have uh, an NX, which you should, but if you don't, uh, coming soon, right? If you don't, tell your athlete in between sets to focus on an exhale, right? Focus on blowing off that CO2 because more CO2 that you can blow off the faster your body can drop off the oxygen that's needed. Mm -hmm. So you don't, and that's just understanding bioenergetics. That's it. Okay. I can have my athletes, you know, perform an exercise and then focus on a hard exhale so they can recover a little bit faster. Right. Um, But I I do think that what's sad, I know I kind of harped on elevation mask, but like hypoxic training is training for altitude. Right. So you can use that to your advantage. You can use it to help build capillary density and tissue. Um, Getting your athletes used to and comfortable with the mental side of a fatigue and high CO2 state will only benefit you later down the road. And you want to make, you want to make some guy tough, like have him be able to do work, you know, in a high CO2 environment. You know, you'll, you'll find out, you know, you'll have these big eyes and they'll, they'll crumble. They'll put, Oh my God. Oh my God. You know, there's, there's no need to, to freak out. You're fine. You have plenty of oxygen. You know, they just don't necessarily have a threshold. Um, and don't Brian does such a better job explaining this. Just understand that, you know, your, your breathing can help regulate your emotions. You're on the court, right? You get in this high CO2 state. You're like, Oh man, I'm fatigued. I start to panic your decision-making goes next thing you know, you've, you've caused a turnover, right? Let's just get athletes used to that feeling. Let's, let's build up their tolerance and let's have them actually do coordinated movement in a high CO2 fatigue state. Like that's a, that's a whole nother uh, training gem that have your athlete go hypoxic and then have them do coordinated work. Right. Um, I'm waiting for somebody to like make a quarterback go hypoxic and then like make reads on a defense. You know, that's what, that's what I would be doing. Um, but yeah, the, the, the more that you dive into the energetic side, the more you see, there's just so many different ways to utilize uh, breathing and help it benefit you from the mental side to the rehab side, to the training side, to the nutrition side. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's really endless. So I think, if, if people can take one thing away, it's just start diving in that rabbit hole because it'll find a way to win you games pretty quick because 
there's only a finite people that are interested in it right now. Pat, I want to finish with some rapid fire questions uh, with you today. Uh, so first of all, what are you currently fascinated about in the performance field? What am I currently fascinated? Uh, I would probably say I've been getting into the force plate stuff a little bit more. That was something that we've got dual force plates. Um, but I want to get that. I would probably say that is a, a weakness of mine. And I think it's a, it's a testing protocol that we could get better at. Um, mm -hmm. looking back, picking on myself a little bit. I should have probably tested this athlete that we had recently a little bit more frequently. Fre frequently. Um, I like to say that the Omega Wave and even even the Moxie so much, like the Omega Wave is like a lie detector. Like my athletes will come in and they'll be like, I partied all weekend. Like I didn't drink enough water. I'm, I'm dehydrated. I, I ate all kinds of bad shit. Like they'll, <laughs> they'll tell you right away. But man, the force plates really hold us accountable. You know, like if, if we see that, you know, the force flight numbers aren't moving in the right direction, that's on us and, and the programming 100%. So mm. if there's, if there's one thing that I want to dive uh, better into, it's, it's having a better understanding of, uh, of the force plates. What's an element that you've added recently to your, let's say overall model of coaching that has made a, that has had a significant impact recently. Um, I think that uh, the first thing that, you know, I thought about this a little bit when I was thinking about Jim Radcliffe when, when I brought his name up, and that's uh, definitely communication. So when I went to Oregon, I watched him, aside from obviously the warm-up, but, like, the guy walked around and he might have gave, like, five cues the whole session. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And all those guys look great. And I was just like, man, this guy's not screaming. He's not yelling at all this information. He literally just picked the one cue that that athlete needed to hear and, uh, and was able to deliver it really well. And I think that looking back, like communication was an issue for me when I was a strength coach, especially learning to communicate information to other coaches and getting people to buy into a new philosophy. And even you get into a habit of, sometimes with the population that we work with, especially like general population people that come in, like, you're like, Oh, this is super repetitive. We've seen this before, but like still being an effective communicator, mm -hmm. listening. Um, I just, uh, we, I'm thinking of a couple of different scenarios where I could have probably communicated and listened a lot better. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was, I was even lucky to have guys like, Todd Wright and like I said Jim Radcliffe <clears throat> you know kind of kind of show me kind of how it's done from a communication standpoint um, but that's always something that I can get better at I mean at the end of the day uh, we're talking about super advanced concepts you know what I mean and I have to be able to deliver those advanced concepts to people in ways that are a little more simplistic so I hope that's one thing that I did today is just try to like not bombard people with you know, big words and just try to like, Hey, this is simply, this is what it is, you know? Um, so communication is something that, that I'm definitely trying to work on. What would you like to see less often in the strength and conditioning field? Oh, man, that's a good one. <laughs> um, man, I'm not a big, as you know, I'm not a big social media person, but, um, why can't somebody just post somebody doing a really good squat? You know, <laughs> like let's just post like fundamentals and do them well. I think, I think that's, that's one thing that I would like to see. It's just people just not trying to like have this like flash, you know, and that we're doing, and I even get caught up with it because the shit that I think is cool that I want to put on Instagram, Aaron's like, wait, this isn't what we, what we do every day. But I was like, look what we do. It's super cool. You know what I mean? So I got to call myself out on that. But it's like, you know, I think like it was a long time ago, but there was a basketball strength coach that showed like five clips of his guys and they're all squatting really well and getting big guys to squat well is not easy. And I was like, man, I really like that, you know? Um, so just 
seeing like the fundamental things done well. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave you. I'll leave you with that one. Uh, a book to read. Man, a couple, couple come to mind. You can, um, you can say a couple. <laughs> That's all right. Okay. Uh, I would say, well, I tell, I tell all my athletes, like, and I'm sorry, interns, I was like, start with Anatomy Trains by Thomas Myers. Mm -hmm. That's a great book for just having appreciation for the fascial system and the way the body is connected. Um, another... Another book would be The Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, kind of when we're talking about like finite details and stuff like that. I feel like that's a really good book mm -hmm. for coaches to read. Um, man, what's, a, what's another really good book? Um, yeah, I'll probably just, I'll probably just leave you with, with those two before we get too crazy. Irrational Impredictability by Dan Artley, I think is, it's not even like a real training book, but mm -hmm. that always comes to mind. Like, um, and then, yeah, yeah, there's, there's a couple, but we'll be here for another. <laughs> we'll be here. I've, I've honestly, I've been reading a lot of, uh, trying to get away from reading like training stuff and just reading mm -hmm. like, things that, that aren't necessarily related to, you know, strength and conditioning and uh, finding, finding other avenues to, to read about. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I'll, I'll leave you, I'll leave you with those. Maybe you need to give me one. What's the, what, what, what are you reading right now? Oh, I'm reading, I just finished the oxygen advantage, which should be called the CO2 advantage <laughs> for all of those listening. Um, yeah. I was about to dive into breath by James Nestor um but uh a coach a fellow coach a friend of mine andreas a shout out to you andreas if you're listening uh just gave me the the process uh the book number one by fergus Connolly and cam joss uh, so that's uh I, I started last night and that was that was a lot of fun um it's a good good to see the perspective that he takes when it comes to you know again winning games what, what is it about from an organizational standpoint, the staff, uh, what do you need to put in place? Uh, what, what does the philosophy need to be for the, the whole organization? All those things that, again, are not talked about nearly enough when it comes to high performance, I think. So I think that's going to be a, a good one to, to get into. So that's, that's what's on my... On my have you read Legacy? I have not. Legacy is good. It's on the All Blacks. That's a great right. book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So mm -hmm. I'll have sure. to dive into Man, that. Any book on John Wooden. John Wooden has some has some really good books out. But yeah, this is going down a tangent. We gotta <laughs> we'll start talking now, about it. Now now all the listeners have about ten books to go through. That's okay. <laughs> they'll they'll keep them occupied through Christmas. Uh yeah. last one for you, Pat. Uh a coach to follow. Ooh. Man, I I mean, I probably already already any one of the any of the guys that I've said their name, you mm -hmm. know, like the Dan Pass, um, oh Logan Schwartz. That's like he's he's been a mentor, a friend. He's still in Austin. Um, he's an amazing movement specialist, uh, and I have not given him enough enough credit. Um, and then guys like uh, Andrew Hauser. Uh, from the Dodgers, um, he's he's somebody that I've been going back and forth with. Uh, look out for what he's going to do. I feel like you know we need more guys that are you know open minded and and he's one of those coaches for sure. But then obviously uh, you know Todd Wright, uh, he has had such an impact on me as as a person as a coach. Mm -hmm. uh, just just about everything and. Uh, and if you don't know who Bill Tierney is, look up Bill Tierney. If there was one guy I wish that I could have worked for for a little bit longer, it was it was Bill Tierney uh, at the University of Denver. So, but thanks for thanks for having me on, man. This was great. I really appreciated it. Oh no, um, man, it was it was my pleasure, Pat. I wanted to say where where can people find you on uh, on social media? Uh, just Evolve HP uh, is our Instagram handle. Um, and 
yeah, just just if I like to I like to think me and Aaron are are pretty pretty open. Um, I think for a long time Aaron was way too open, so that's something that I I harped on him about. Um, I can't tell you how many guys definitely moving in this space uh, have talked with Aaron at length, and you never hear his name mentioned. Hmm. You know, and that's one thing that always bothers me is. I don't think he gets enough, he, you know, credit. I hope one thing that if I said something today and there was a coach out there that was the one that educated me on it, I hope I gave you credit today um, because I definitely didn't come up with it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, just making sure that we kind of give credit where credit is due is, is definitely important to me and uh, being humble enough to, to say that you didn't come up with this idea or that idea. So, yeah. But once again, man, thanks for, uh, thanks for having me. That was a pleasure, Pat. Have a great one. All right. Take care.